one. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back this evening for our late night hangout with Coverdale class who are doing their space science week and are having a sleepover tonight. So if anybody watched the um, stars hangout that we had earlier, apparently there's been lots of good stargazing this evening. Um, so did you manage to spot any colours of stars in the skies tonight? And what did you spot, Freya? Um, I spotted a lot of um, white ones and blue and red ones. White and red ones? Really? Yeah. I spotted one that was dashing blue and red. Oh, blue and red. What's the then, Olivia? No? <laughs> yeah. That's actually, it's a really important thing that you've said there, actually, about um, you seeing the different colours flashing, because it's very easy. I often get confused and think I'm seeing something, and then you take a longer look at it, and you draw on what you've learned and what you know, and if it fits with what you understand, and that's what science is about. So don't ever feel um, embarrassed that, if you make a mistake in fact one of the things i wanted to say sorry for is earlier somebody asked me how many stars are in our galaxy um and i gave you the wrong answer so i've got the right answer for you um later on today so it's all right to make mistakes and science is all about learning from your mistakes and coming up with the best possible answer and moving forward so that's really cool um anything else interesting did you see any good constellations this evening george what did you see um, orion and the orion the plow I saw Orion, the Dipper, and Mars. Oh, we saw Mars, yeah. We saw Mars. Yeah. I saw the Lion, I saw the Dipper, I saw the Orion, and I saw Mars. And Mars, there's another one that we saw. James, can you remember what else we saw? Um, no, but I think it was Beetlejuice. Actually. Beetlejuice, we were quite excited by that, weren't we? Jesse? Mercury. Mercury? Um, I don't this is not a constellation, but me and Rebecca saw a galaxy. Oh, wow. What was the other one that we saw that we've talked about, Sunny? Orion's Bell. Yeah, Orion's Bell. And? The Seven Sisters. The Seven Sisters. We saw that. And with the binoculars, that looked amazing. And there was another one. Mr. Simmons' favourite queen. Cassiopeia. Yes, Cassiopeia. we Maybe. did. We saw that one too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And lots that we didn't really know what they were, but they looked pretty. Yes, I mean, that's the thing. I didn't, There's 88 different constellations. I can't remember them all. We can't see them all at certain times of the year. But you mentioned the plough. That's part of Ursa Major. And that's one that we can see all year round um, from where we are in the UK. Um, if you're elsewhere, um, people down in Australia can see different ones at different times. Um, and it's all to do with the tilt of our Earth and how things are moving. And somebody was talking about the North Star Polaris earlier. And that's one that's quite handy because it just so happens just by luck, it's like pointing straight north and you can see that all the time. Um, and it just happens to be right in the middle of the way our sky spins. So that's one a useful one for if you're lost because it's always to the north. Um, so yeah, it changes all the time. And like I say, those 88 constellations are based on people drawing patterns and you can make up your own patterns and there's different ones from different um, regions of the world that people have had over the years. So it's interesting. So don't worry if you can't remember them all. That's what charts are for. And it's not about remembering everything. It's about knowing how to look stuff up and where to look stuff up. So that's really interesting and really good that you've done that this evening. Um, so today we were talking about these stars and we were looking at some things that were really far away and really big and it's really hard to get your head around. So today I'm going to give you a bit of a talk about the scale of the universe and hopefully it might become a little bit clearer exactly how big our universe is. So if you bear with me, I'm going to share my screen and here we go. And then you can tell me if you can see um my slides <coughs> how's that look can you see what's on my screen yeah okay brilliant so the scale of the universe so scale when we say scale often people think of um measuring scales or weighing scales um and what we mean in this context is putting something into a size that's more convenient for us to understand it. So we do this all the time. When you um, look at Google Maps on your phone or you get out an A to Z to look at a map, it's not the size of the real world because otherwise, how would you use it? If you wanted to get across town, you couldn't have something the size of a town. So you scale it down and make it smaller. And you usually do this by um, minimizing it by a factor of something. So it might be half the size or a tenth of the size or a hundredth of the size, depending on how big the thing is you want to look at. And so you're talking about 
making it a more manageable size to understand. And we scale things up sometimes. If we wanted to know what an ant looks like, it's quite hard to see the details. So people might make a model of an ant and scale it up and make it bigger so that we can see the details. Um, and we're going to be talking about the scale of the universe and trying to understand some of these measurements and distances. Um, and in order to do that, astronomers have come up with different language and terms to understand how big things are because simple centimeters and meters and miles often just don't cut it. Um, so earlier we were talking about the atom and this is a really small thing. Um, and the interesting thing about <coughs> them is they're really tiny anyway, but they're also um, a, an unusual shape and there's not a lot to them when you start to look at it. So if we start really small, atoms are really tiny um, and they're about a 10 billionth of a meter across. They're so small that if you took a pin like the one on the screen, um, which is about maybe a millimeter, a millimeter and a half across, you could fit about one trillion hydrogen atoms on the head of a pin. So that's a one with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 zeros after it. So that's a huge number. And we're going to be talking about really big numbers today. And I've got um, in a moment, I've got a slide to show you how many zeros go after these words, because it's really hard to get your head around. But what's interesting about atoms is that they're over 99.9% .9 empty space. So most of you, most of me, most of everything you touch is actually empty space. Because in the middle, you've got the nucleus that we talked about earlier. And then you've got the electron sort of orbiting around the nucleus. But in between, there's nothing. It's just empty space. And it's about the equivalent of putting a P in the middle of a football stadium. And that's how much empty space you've got, with the P being the nucleus and the edge of the stadium being your um, electron cloud orbiting around and everything in between is just nothing so most of most of you is empty space so that's quite an interesting thing when you think about how many atoms there are and that most of them are empty um, so atoms are very interesting things and we can do another talk uh, about atoms if you're interested so just let me know um, here's a picture recently that won an award for one of the best science um, um, photographs and it's really lovely it was taken by a PhD student called David Nadlinger who took this photo of a glowing atom that he um, put inside this special machine that fires lasers at it and um, illuminates this atom and this is quite a big atom it's much bigger than a hydrogen atom but it's still tiny and it's just floating there right in the middle um, and so this is a really impressive picture because it's very hard to photograph an atom and he had to have a long exposure where he let the light come into the camera for a long time in order to take this picture. Um, and I think in reality, there's only a, a millimeter or two in between those two um, electrodes on the on the side that are letting that, that atom hover in between and be illuminated so that we can see it. So it's really fantastic photograph. Um, so to look at the numbers, to try and get your head around it. So 1,000 is a one with three zeros after it. One million is a thousand thousand, so six zeros. One billion is a thousand million, so nine zeros. And then one trillion is a million million, so that's your 12 zeros. And then we're going to go all the way up and look at one quadrillion um, today. So these are really big numbers. And don't worry if it kind of like makes sense because this is the point with the universe. It's so big and so vast and so old that it's very hard for us to under, understand in human terms because day to day we really only deal in things that are centimeters and meters and maybe kilometers across on a day to day basis. So all big numbers. And to give you an idea of how much bigger a billion is than a million, one million seconds is about 11 and a half days, but a billion seconds is 31 years. And then a trillion seconds is 31,700 years. So, you know, you, when you think of someone who's a millionaire and someone who's a billionaire, this is how much more money they have than a millionaire. It's a huge difference. Once you add those zeros up, um, it really goes up on a huge scale. So we're talking really, really big numbers today. Um, so scale of the terrestrial planets. Um, I think we had a look at some of these images for our solar system recently um, and how big the planets are compared to each other. But today we're going to go even further and look at some of the, the bigger stars too and uh, across the universe and see how big these distances are. So here we've got Mercury, Mars, Venus and Earth, our terrestrial planets with our solid surfaces. And you can see that Venus and Earth are about the same size there. Mars is about half the size and then little Mercury on the end. Um, and yeah, yeah, Earth is bigger than Mercury, but not that much bigger, right? But then we move out into um, the rest of our 
um, solar system to the gas giants. And now you've got Earth there on the bottom left. And it's very small now. You can barely see it. And you can see that um, Neptune and Uranus are, are way bigger. Saturn is huge and Jupiter is massive. And the interesting thing about Jupiter is although it doesn't look that much bigger than Saturn here, it's actually got a lot more mass. It weighs a lot more. So you could actually fit the mass of all of the other planets in the solar system within Jupiter's mass. So um, it's important to remember that the size of something, its measurement across or diameter, doesn't necessarily mean that its mass is that much bigger or smaller. Some things can be very dense. So if you imagine if you picked up a, a little block of polystyrene, it might be the same size as a block of metal, but the metal would be heavier because it's denser. It's made of heavier stuff and there's more mass inside a, a block of metal than in a similar size block of polystyrene. Um, so yeah, Jupiter is pretty big there. Earth is pretty much dwarfed in size. We talked before about how the red spot is, is about three times bigger than Earth. So Jupiter is a really big one. Um, does anyone want to have a guess of how many Earths we can fit inside Jupiter? Yeah. What do you think, Harry? 1,300. 1,300. What do you think, Sophie? 1 million. 1 million? Uh, 1,300. 1, about 1,300. Uh, Freya? <coughs> 1,005,000. 1, 1,005,000. Ah, oh, yeah, and uh, let's have one from Lewis. Go on then, James. Round about 1,320 Earths. 1,320 Earths. What do you think? I think that some people have been doing some research here. <laughs> about 1,300 Earths. So that's really good research you've been doing there. And some of them are quite a big number. And we are going to come to some objects with a huge number of Earths in. So don't you worry. If you go, if you like the big numbers of Earths fitting inside stuff, then I have something for you a little bit later. Uh, so now we've moved up to the sun. This is our sun. And down there on the right, you've got Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and then these tiny little specks that you probably can't even see are the terrestrial planets. So this is how much bigger our sun is. So you can fit the mass and diameter of all our solar system planets very easily inside the sun. Um, does anyone know how many Earths we could fit inside our sun? How many Earths fit in the sun? I'll come to you last, James. Um, Freddie? A quadrillion. What do you think? 50,000. 50,000. Emily? A million. Um, Lucy? Two million. Two million. Um, Harrison? The highest number possible. Okay, Ben. <laughs> Google Plexion, I love that, that word. Um, <laughs> yes, George. Three million. And last of all, what do you think, Layla? Um, 100 million. 100 million. Let's see what it is. So 1.3 million Earths can fit inside the sun. So the sun is huge. So some good guesses there. But, you know, it's interesting we think of Jupiter as this massive giant planet, and it is, but it really is dwarfed in comparison to our sun. So now we're going to move on and have a look at how we measure some of the distances within our solar system. Um, the distance between Earth and the sun is about 93 million miles or about 150 million kilometers. And so in order to make things a bit simpler, um, we came up with this idea of astronomical units. So it's based on the distance, the average distance between Earth and the sun. And so we call one astronomical unit um, the same distance as the Earth to the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometers. So if we say Earth is one AU, one astronomical unit from the Sun, then we can use that unit to measure other distances. So Mercury is about 0.4 AU from the Sun because it's closer. Then Venus around 0.7. Earth is one because that's how we defined it. Mars is 1.5, so it's like half the distance again. Um, Jupiter, then, is a big jump there. There's a big jump between um, Mars and Jupiter. So, so far, we've been around about the one astronomical unit mark, but now we've jumped up to 5.2 astronomical units away for Jupiter. Then we go up to 9.5 for Saturn, then close to 20 astronomical units for Uranus, then up again to 30 for Neptune and then little old Pluto is around 40 astronomical units away. So these distances between the planets are very, very large. And often when we see um, pictures and books, they don't really give us an idea of how far apart these planets are. 
Um, they can show us the relative sizes of the planets, but in order to draw those spaces, you need quite a lot of paper to be able to draw them. Um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to have a look at it yet, but I sent over some links earlier that you can try out to show you the scale of the solar system and of the universe. And I'll also link those um, under the YouTube video for anyone at home that wants to play around with those. Um, they really are vast distances. So does anyone know, if you drew the sun, as the size of a basketball on a piece of paper, how wide would your piece of paper have to be in order for you to draw all of the planets up to Neptune? So your sun is the size of a basketball and you need to roll out your paper until you can draw Neptune at the correct scaled distance away from the sun. Does anyone know how long your piece of paper would have to be? Anybody want to give a guess? What do you think, Ben? A kilometer. A kilometer? Okay. Any, any different? What do you think, Jack? Two meters. Two meters. Bit of a difference there. Sophie? Five meters. Five meters. You were going to say the same. James? 1.5. 1. 1.5 what? 1.5 meters. 1. 5 meters. One last guess. 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers. Oh, wow. Quite a range there. Quite a range of guesses. And the first one was right. You would need a one kilometer, that's a thousand meters or 0.6 miles. Wow. Pay piece of paper, if you drew the sun as the size of a basketball, you need to roll that out for one kilometre to be able to draw the scaled solar system correctly. And this is why they don't put it in books, because you'd all have to open your books and roll them out outside of your classroom, down the corridor, outside the school, across the road, into God knows where, to be able to look at the scale of the solar system. So it really is a massive distance in between the planets. So this is why they never draw it to scale in the books, which is fair enough. But if you have a look at that link that I sent you, um, you can scroll across. It's a really great website. I'll put the link on the YouTube and you can scroll across in sort of like, it will give you a measurement as you go across and you're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And it's empty space, empty space, empty space. And eventually you come to Mercury, the first planet. And then as you go on, it gets worse and worse. So you'll probably get bored once you get to Jupiter, uh, I'm guessing, but um, you can then use the scroll bar to whiz across, but it will give you some sense of, of how big those distances are. Um, so now on to other stars that are much bigger. So we have Jupiter down there on the bottom left. And um, then we talked earlier about red dwarfs, some of the smaller stars, cooler stars. And that, that second one along is a, um, a red dwarf called Wolf 359. And then there's our sun um, there in the, in the middle, that sort of bigger orange one. And on the right, we have Sirius, which is a nice big blue star. And that's one of the, the ones you might have seen it tonight. It's near Orion. It's a very bright star in, in our sky. Um, and that is quite a bit bigger than our sun. It really is quite big there. So I want you to remember Sirius and how much bigger it was than our sun, because now we're going to move up to the next set of stars and see how Sirius compares to some bigger stars. That's Sirius on the bottom left there. So now you're starting to really see how big these um, sizes are and how they jump up. So Sirius is on that little blue ball on the left. Then we have a star called Pollux, another one called Arcturus, and then Aldebaran, which is massive. So I'm just gonna flick back now to give you an idea. Sirius was that much bigger than our sun. And now Sirius is that much smaller than this next set of stars. So you can imagine our sun would just be a little tiny ball in the corner there. So these are huge, absolutely massive. Um, to give you an idea of scale, our sun uh, is about 1.3 million kilometers across. So these are really getting big now. So now remember that Aldebaran on the right, that's so much bigger than Sirius. And now there's Aldebaran on the left. Jump down to that tiny little ball on the bottom left. And then we have Rigel, which I think a lot of you saw tonight shining in, in Orion. And then we have Antares and then Betelgeuse, which you also would have seen that red supergiant um, in Orion that's due to blow up soon. And you can see how much bigger Betelgeuse is than Aldebaran, which was back here that much bigger than Sirius. So these stars are really jumping up. And now remembering how big Betelgeuse is and how absolutely massive that star is compared to all these others, we now jump up to see the biggest star that we know of. Um, on the far right is VY Canis Majoris. So Betelgeuse is there on the left. And then you have these other stars that are getting bigger and bigger. And now um, VY Canis Majoris is about... The, um, the biggest star that we know of, and it's about two, tri two trillion, no, two billion kilometers across. And so if we were to fit Earth inside of VY Canis Majoris, 
you would be able to fit two quadrillion, seven hundred and fifty nine trillion, four hundred and sixty billion Earth inside that star on the right. So at the bottom there, you can see how many zeros that has. So VY Canis Majoris truly is a giant. And I think that's um, currently the biggest star that we know of, but who knows, there might be something bigger out there. And these are only stars we're talking about. When we get to galaxies, we're gonna have to start using some different units to understand some of these distances. So what we tend to use is the light year. And it's a bit confusing because we say light year, and year is a unit of time, but the light year is a unit of distance. So a light year is the distance covered if you travel at the speed of light, which is around 300,000 kilometers per second for one year. And that um, equals about nine trillion kilometers. So you can see there's all these zeros here and we do have ways of um, writing things down shorter without all the zeros called scientific notation, which you, you'll get to see in a lot of your textbooks as you move along through your career in school. Um, but we typically use light years once we start getting up to these massive distances. Um, and earlier today, I don't know if anyone can remember, I, I told you how many light minutes um, it took the light from the sun to come to Earth, which is about one AU, 150 million kilometers. Does anyone remember, remember how many light minutes it took for the light to reach the sun to Earth? Jack, do you remember? Two minutes. Two minutes? Well, Ben, what did you think? Uh, eight. Eight? Eight. Eight. Five. Five. Eight. eight. Seems most got more eights there, Jacqueline. Was that right? They're very good. It's just over eight minutes. So anything that happens on the surface of the sun, we wouldn't know about for eight minutes. And as far as we understand, the speed of light, which going back is about 300,000 kilometers per second, um, that seems to be the speed limit for the universe. Um, from what people understand of physics, um, going any faster than that doesn't seem to be possible. And it's also important to remember that when they talk about the speed of light, they're talking about the speed of light in a vacuum, meaning in a space with no air in it, because air slows light down and so does water. And you can see this very easily if you put a spoon in a jar of water, you'll see it looks bent, right? If, you, if you've ever put anything into a jar of water, um, the change in the speed of light as it's coming through that medium of the water means that what you're looking at inside looks bent. Um, so whenever we're talking about the speed of light, we're talking about it in a vacuum, which space pretty much is um, a vacuum. So uh, this is why they tend to use this and that's what they mean. But bear in mind that if light goes through something else, air or water or something like that, it will change its speed. But these these are really big distances. And so the sun is fairly close by, but still pretty far, right? And that takes about eight minutes. We spoke earlier about our nearest star um, and star system Alpha Centauri, uh, and that's about four light years away. So traveling at the speed of light, it would take you four years to get to the next nearest star after the sun. So the Milky Way, the Milky Way is our galaxy. And, um, if you look at this little arrow here, we're sitting on a little arm um, of the Milky Way, about two thirds of the way to the edge. Uh, and I was wondering, does anyone um, think that this is a bit strange? If we are here, then how could we take a picture of the Milky Way? Do, do you think this is really a picture that we took of the Milky Way or, or not? What do you think? What do you think, James? I think it's So why do you think, how did we take that picture then? Um, there, I'm not sure, but I think there is actually certain, some, some people just make pictures of, but I think this one's been taken from an actual, like, probe or telescope that's gone straight out, and this mission is to go as far away as it can from the Earth and take lots and lots of pictures and turn back to Earth. Oh, so something travelling away from Earth with a telescope on it. What do you think, Lola? I think that... Um, Someone was looking through a, a telescope that went really far, um, and um, a really good artist was drawing it as what they saw. Oh, so an artist has drawn it from what they, they were seeing. Um, what do you think, Noah? A satellite, that went past our solar system. A satellite outside our solar system. Let's find out. So it would be lovely if that was the case, but unfortunately, there's no way we've got even a tiny amount as far as it would take to take a picture like this of our own galaxy. Um, 
The furthest thing away that we've ever sent is part of the Voyager mission. So one of the Voyager probes has just left our solar system. So it's just gone out past Pluto. And as you've seen, that's a very, very long distance. It's nothing to be sniffed at. It's a really long way to Pluto, about 40 astronomical units. But that's no way near far away enough to get outside of our galaxy. We've barely even less left our own solar system. So our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So even if Voyager was traveling at the speed of light, which is no way near traveling that fast, it would still take it um, uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of years to get across the galaxy. So unfortunately, this isn't a picture of our Milky Way, but it's a picture of quite a similar um, galaxy. So we can only kind of guess what our galaxy looks like um, because we're inside it, right? So it's like trying to see what your school looks like from inside the classroom. But you can make a pretty good guess. You will know what the windows look like, um, what shape the windows are and what they might look like from outside. And more importantly, you might be able to see other schools and know this is what the other schools all look like. I'll bet our one looks similar. And so we can kind of guess what the Milky Way looks like by looking at it from inside and then comparing it to other galaxies that we can see um, and one way we can take pictures of the Milky Way is if you are ever lucky enough to go somewhere where it's really dark, if you ever get to go to the desert or the forest where there's no lights around and you haven't got what they call light pollution from all the street lamps and houses and cars, then you can actually get to see the Milky Way in the sky. Mm -hmm. And here you've got to imagine that we're sitting in the middle of uh, discs and this is edge on the Milky Way galaxy across the sky so we're looking into the center of it so if you imagine if you earth is here um on this where this little arrow is and then we're looking into the center of it across the disc going up and down across the um, top to bottom of this picture that's the center of the milky way that we're looking into and you can see there's some sort of dark patches where there's probably clouds of gas light getting blocked from getting to us and then lots of light in clusters which are all little bunches of stars um, so we can see the Milky Way, but we're looking at it from inside. So unfortunately, um, it won't be uh, um, anytime soon that we'll be able to get anything far away enough to take a picture like that. We can because of other beautiful galaxies. Um, so one of the galaxies that we can take a picture of is the Andromeda Galaxy. And going back to what I was saying earlier, someone asked me how many stars are in the Milky Way. We think it's somewhere around the 250 billion mark. So just in our galaxy alone, around 250 billion stars. Might be more, might be less, but it's around that. And in Andromeda, which is about 400,000 light years across, it's got a trillion stars in Andromeda, we think. So wow. there are lots and lots and lots of stars. Um, does anybody want to guess how many galaxies there might be? Ooh, how many galaxies? What do you think, Freddie? 40 quadrillion. 40 quadrillion. What do you think, Dave? Well, I don't really know. There's no end to space because there can't be nothing. Because you can have blackness and nothing in there, but you still have that space of blackness. So I don't really know. Oh, interesting thinking going on there. I think 10. Ted, when you're giggling, so I think you're thinking maybe there's more. Or do you think, Ted? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Rebecca? Um, a thousand. A thousand. Uh, Sophie? 2003. 2003, very exact. George? <laughs> I kind of think the same as James. Okay. Noah? Unlimited. Unlimited. Uh, ben? Uh, Google Flex Infinity. I think we're liking some of these big words, Jacqueline. I love it because this is about thinking big. And you know what? It's not that silly because the universe, is, some of the um, answers you were given there about we don't know how big the universe is, we don't know where it ends, what's at the edge of it. These are really important questions. And there's a whole field of study for this called cosmology. So the cosmos is... Um, the universe essentially and word cosmos means order or the opposite of chaos so cosmologists are often thought to be people that are really thinking about these really important really difficult questions of how did the universe begin where did it come from what is the big bang where does it end what shape is it how long does it go on for 
what will happen to it? Was it always here? Will it always be there? And so it almost crosses over to sort of philosophy or metaphysics or thinking about really interesting, strange concepts, but stuff that really makes you wonder who you are and why you're here. And it's you're not being silly. This is a genuine field of science, cosmology. If you're into these big numbers and these big questions about what it means to be in the universe, then cosmology is the science for you. But it's a it's pretty out there because, you know, I'm quite lucky I study Mars generally day to day. And although that's quite far away, as we've seen, we've sent robots there and we've trundled around with rovers on the surface. Eventually, we'll send humans there. And there are rocks there that you can pick up and put under a microscope and and check what they're made of. But when it comes to cosmology, there's a lot more um special types of thinking going on where people have to do mathematical equations and think about philosophical concepts and understand things that happened billions of years ago or things that will happen billions of years in the future and these huge numbers that you're talking about. So yeah, cosmology is an interesting one. So we think there's probably um, well over two trillion galaxies, probably more, we don't know. And this is a really famous image taken by the Hubble telescope, which was a space telescope that's floating around in space that was sent up. Um, and what it did is it pointed its telescope into just a blank patch of space and just nothing there in particular, a few stars maybe. And then it just opened its lens and it did a long exposure, similar to what um, that picture of the atom we looked at earlier. So when you take a picture, you let light in and normally on a normal camera, like an old school camera, and, um, it will sort of open the shutter and close it because if you leave it open too long, too much light will come in and it will just ruin your picture. But if you're trying to look at something really dim and really far away in the dark, you might want to have a long exposure and open your shutter for a long time and see what happens. And so this is what happened when the Hubble telescope opened its shutter for 11 days, pointing at a random blank patch of space a tiny patch of space <coughs> it came back and looked at what it got all of these points of lights that you see here are galaxies 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 and this is true no matter what direction you point your telescope in galaxies 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 and so we think there are over two trillion galaxies probably more Every one of those galaxies probably has hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of stars, maybe even trillions of stars. And from what we've been doing recently, looking at exoplanets to look at planets um, around other stars, it seems that most of the stars that we're looking at will probably have planets around. So there are pretty much an infinite number of planets probably in our universe, which means that the odds of finding life somewhere get better and better. But as we've seen, really far away. So in one of these galaxies in this picture, there may well be a solar system around a star somewhere. Who knows what kind of star? Who knows what kind of planets are on it? Who's on it? But they're so far away from us. How could they send us a message? I mean, we've only been using the radio for about 100 years or so on this planet. So if we looking at these distances, which are millions and billions of light years away, our radio signals can't travel any faster than the speed of light. So how can we contact them? But my hope is there that there is somewhere out there, there's somebody right now talking to a group of students with a similar picture pointing in a different direction, talking to their little alien friends about who might be watching and who might be talking. So who knows? But there are trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of stars out there. Um, and I hope that one of them's got a planet around them with something similar going on um, right now. So that would be interesting. Um, now, these galaxies, um, and there's different shaped galaxies. You can have a look at into galaxy classification. You get spiral galaxies like the Milky Way and Andromeda, and you also get ones that are sort of ball-shaped and all various different shapes and sizes. Um, but we tend to group them into what we call superclusters, where it seems the galaxies have kind of formed a little bit of a pattern. And here we've got an example of a local supercluster that we're part of. Um, and I don't know if you can see, this is a little scale bar here. This is 100 million light years. So we're talking, this is this whole thing is several hundred million <laughs> years across. So the Andromeda galaxy was 400,000 light years across. And this supercluster is several hundred million light years across. So now we're getting into really, really big um, structures. And it seems that this structure of the universe is pretty uniform. Everywhere we look, we kind of see the same sort of pattern of clusters of galaxies around. Um, and it brings me back to the point that somebody was saying about what's at the edge of the universe, what can be um, at the end of it. And so we have this concept called the observable universe. And the observable universe is about 93 billion light years across. Um, 
Now, it's interesting they use the term observable universe. Um, this doesn't mean that we've actually observed it all because some of it is so far away um, that we we just can't see it or there hasn't been time for the light to get to us. But this is to do with what we think the age of the universe is. So we think that the universe is around 14 billion years old um, and it's expanding. So we can actually do another talk another time about the expansion of the universe and what there's quite a lot of evidence for that. But we think that if the universe is around 14 billion years old and it's expanding at the rate that we think it is, then 93 billion light years is the limit of the observable universe that has had time um, since the beginning of the universe to travel back to us. And um, so this is what we kind of say is our limit. But the truth is, we don't really know what's outside this we don't know if this is going to collapse back in on itself one day we don't know if we are the only universe and some of these theories are a little bit out there or don't have much evidence for it but there's lots of stuff about various different types of multiverses and all sorts of different things where maybe time moves differently and one of the big questions is what was here before what will be here after and what's outside of it um and it's, it all makes you feel very small, but I think it's a really wonderful thing that we're thinking about these sorts of questions and we're really lucky to be here. We know that in our solar system, there isn't any evidence of other civilizations or people um, talking and sending out technology. So we're very lucky to be one of the planets that we know has life on it and can ask these questions and can think about it. So while it might make you feel quite small, I think it's a really wonderful thing that we're able to even measure this the the fact that we've even come up with any ideas about how this works means that we are very special and it's a very wonderful thing that we're here um and i think that's the end of my slideshow about the scale of the universe so i will come back to you and stop sharing there we go and then you should see me i'm back now so does anybody have any questions about the scale of the universe and i'll do my best to answer them um, Freya, um, um, do we know of any more um, solar systems that are like, um, that are quite big? Are you thinking bigger than ours? Yeah. Do we know of any solar systems bigger than ours? That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer in terms of um, the distances, like I've been describing to you for hours. Um, one of the most populated ones that we know of is the Trappist system, which has seven planets in it. And um, what's interesting about trying to find uh, exoplanets or planets around other stars than our own is that there's a bit of a bias towards finding bigger ones because bigger ones are easier to find and there's different ways we find them sometimes we we can actually do a talk about this because there's loads of really interesting things about exoplanets um you can find them by directly observing them you can find them by watching them go across the surface of their star and making the light dim as the the sun gets eclipsed by the planet um, you can find them by their gravitational effect making the star wobble. But all of these things mean that it's easier to find very big planets. So um, they often call these planets super Jupiters because they're kind of like gas giants. They're even bigger than Jupiter. And they're quite not easy to find, but easier than small Earth-like planets. So I would say that the exoplanets we found, many of them are much, much bigger than Earth and even much, much bigger than Jupiter. But I don't know the answer to your question <coughs> How, um, how big the um, the radius of the orbits of the planets are. But that is something that people will know because there's also a really interesting relationship between how far out a planet is from its star and how long it takes it to go around the star. So if you can time it going round and round, you can work out exactly how far away it is from its home star. So somebody will know the answer to that, but I don't know off the top of my head, but I'll find out for you what our biggest known um, radius of a solar system is. Or an exoplanet system and i'll get back to you and let you know next time that was a great question for her, wasn't it really good question um, let's just have one more question because we need to get in our gym jams jacqueline let you do yeah it's getting late uh, so we'll just have lola um, what is the biggest how many stars has the big is is in the biggest galaxy oh that's a really good question um i'm not sure um of the answer to that, I'm just going to see if I can find out for you right now how many stars in the biggest galaxy. And this is something I'd encourage you to do is to go and look it up if you're not sure um, uh, what the answer is. 
And also we can do a talk one day about where to look and how you know an answer is likely to be right or not, because the internet is a wonderful thing. There's a lot of cool stuff on there, but um, it's difficult to know what's true and what's not because anybody, I, anyone can post on there. So um, we can have a look at how you do critical thinking and how you look up good sources. But I'm gonna have a quick look for you. How many stars in the biggest galaxy? Now, bear in mind, obviously, we can't see every galaxy. We can only see one. Um, so um, the answer I'm getting up here is maybe around the sort of 100 trillion mark, um, the biggest one that we know. Um, and that is the IC1101. So I don't know where that is, but I think this is one of the big ball cluster type galaxies rather than the flat disk ones. They tend to be older and bigger. Um, but uh, yeah. It's really interesting that we can't see, you've seen on that Hubble picture, we can't see all the little details of the stars. So we can only kind of make our best guess by looking at our neighboring stars. But if you wanna look at really big galaxies, go and look at the sort of cluster type galaxies, which tend to be quite old. And a lot of them are full of those first generation type sort of stars that we spoke about earlier that don't have the heavy ele elements in yet. So they're interesting galaxies to look at. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it then. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us so late and for all your wonderful questions. I hope your heads are okay. Um, and thank you for all your big numbers. There's no numbers too big when it comes to studying the galaxy. So that's been really fun. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. And thank you for staying up um, to chat to us. And we'll be in touch. Yes, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.